been watching sermons online. And of course, we're, 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 uh, you've been uh, going through, Brian's been going through the Ten Commandments. And I've, I've got to admit to you that when I contemplate the Ten Commandments, I have a persistent feeling of disappointment and frustration. Uh, maybe you do too. Because I look at the world and I think, um, you know, life is generally a mess and I don't think that it's going very well with this commandment keeping thing. Um, I see the kind of, of conflict and chaos and despair uh, that is brought into people's lives because they don't listen to this. And then I confess, it's very easy for me to blame this on other people. It's very easy for me to look at the world and say, you know, if they just kept the commandments, things would be great. And forget to look in the mirror in that regard. Um, I realize that I am just as much a part of the problem as, as everybody else. Now, this, this is a, a, a famous remark uh, from um, the, uh, the writer and philosopher G.K. Chesterton. A newspaper asked the question, what is wrong with the world? And, and his response has been reported variously, but probably um, the, the likely most accurate one um, is, he said, uh, you're answering the question, what is wrong with the world? The answer to the question, what is wrong, is, or should be, I am wrong. You know, that's, that's, that's what's so frustrating. That's ab about considering what God says to us about what our lives are to be. So what really is our problem here? What is the problem with the world? What is our individual and collective problem? And is there an answer to it? Well, Jesus begins to address this in his famous Sermon on the Mount. And so I'd, I'd like for us to consider these words and think about them as, as they relate to this question. Matthew 5, beginning with verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven." Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven." For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now I'm really frustrated. Now I'm really disturbed. Sounds like we're taking a hard thing and making it harder. Like we're taking our frustration and disappointment and adding something to the point of despair. Salt of the earth, light of the world, righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, not one mark of the commandments being abolished, whoa, that is a load of stuff. But here's what we need to do. When we frame what Jesus is telling us here in the context of the larger story of Scripture, we find something that is full of hope and promise, something with the power to solve our deepest problem. So what is that problem? Well, I would put it this way. Our problem is this. We are rebels. There are lots of terms that we can use to describe what our problem is. We are lawbreakers, as we think about law. We are sinners, that's a term that we use a lot in Christian context. We're wicked, we're selfish, we're corrupt, we're depraved, we have hard hearts. Use any of those, use all of those, use them in combination. That's a description of who we are. This is, of course, what we see in the world around us, it's what we see in the mirror, it's what we see when we read scripture. The story of scripture is really a story of a dysfunctional human family beginning with our first parents, the archetypical rebels, the rebels par excellence. But you notice how that continues generation after generation in the biblical saga? Have you ever said as I have, oh, I wish we could all just as humanity live as, as one family together? Well, in the biblical narrative, there was one family and one of the brothers killed the other. We're not doing well. 
And it goes from there. We go to this, the story of, of the flood, that the, you know, the, the mind of humans was just violence continually. And so God says, I'm going to show you what a do-over looks like. We're going to start again with one family. And then we get to that part, part of the story that, that we don't read to the children because that family doesn't work out so well either. And humanity builds a tower in its, in, its, um, in its hubris, in its rebellion, saying we can become like God. And so out of that, we see the conflict of the nations arise. But to that, God says, I'm going to bless those nations through the seed of Abraham. But who is Abraham? A liar, a trickster. And then that's a generational legacy as his son and his grandsons become the same kind of thing until his great-grandsons, uh, the sons of, of Jacob, take their brother and sell him into slavery in Egypt. That's the story of humanity. And if we, if we take that larger story and move it into the history of the nation of Israel, we can begin to appreciate how Jesus' audience would have heard these words that they were hearing. I always used to tell my, my students uh, teaching uh, the, the larger biblical narrative that as they think of, of the story of the Old Testament, they can focus on Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy was like Moses giving the people of Israel the review before the final exam. The final exam is we're going to go into the land and the review is, well, what's the law and how have we been doing? Well, here's the law, Moses says, and here's how we've been doing and it doesn't look good. Because God says, when you go into the land, I'm giving you the land as a gift, and in response, you should obey my covenant. And if you don't, what's the natural response that I should make? Well, I brought you into the land, I can take you out. If you don't obey, if you prove to be rebellious, I will take you back into bondage, into captivity, the way I brought you out of captivity. And there you will turn to me, and I'll answer you again. Well, this is exactly what has, had happened to the people of Israel over the centuries of the Old Testament narrative. So even in the time of Jesus, if you were to do kind of a man-on-the-street interview, hey, a uh, typical Jewish person of the first century, how do you understand your situation in the world? They'd say, oh, we're in exile. Well, didn't you come back from the exile in Babylon? Yes, but, you know, we didn't all come back, and the world is still a mess, and, and, and the evil empire is still in charge, and God is not honored, and even we, his people, things are, things are terrible with us. We're in exile. So this is, this is the situation as it is described, and, and I like the way it's captured in the text of the second psalm. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth and the, set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, and against his anointed one, his king, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords from us. Well, that's, that epitomizes the human situation. We want to run the show. We don't want a king. We don't want commandments. We don't want laws. We, we want to be an authority unto ourselves. Well, is there any hope for this situation? Yes, God has a solution. God's solution is that God establishes his kingdom. Now, to talk about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, as, as Matthew uses the phrase, that can often sound very mysterious, very, very esoteric. But the concept is simple. The concept of God's kingdom is God takes his world back. God will remake the world to conform to his purpose, to fulfill the design that he has for it, to make it right, and to bring the rebels back under his kind and generous rule. This is how that second psalm continued. And, and let's, let's read from that again. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I have a king, God says, and he will rule again. He will take his world back. Well, this promised reign of God, rule of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, as, as we read in Matthew, is exactly what Jesus announces just before the Sermon on the Mount begins. Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's as if Jesus is saying, God is encamped right over that hill, and you are the rebels, 
and you were outgunned, outnumbered, outmanned, it's hopeless. You have one opportunity. Drop your arms, fall before the king, and ask for his mercy. But he is a generous and gracious king, and he welcomes the rebels back into his reign, his rule, his kingdom. Well, that sounds good. I would much rather be a part of God's kingdom than, than be a rebel, much as I want to run my own life. I don't like the idea of confronting the king. But that leaves us with something else. This promised kingdom that Jesus, does, that Jesus announces, that Jesus brings, has an implication. It has something that it means for you and me. Something maybe even stronger than an implication. Call it a demand. The demand is this, that subjects of the king should be like the king. That in God's kingdom, his subjects, we, his people, need to be like our king. Well, what does it mean to live as subjects of God's kingdom? It means to have the character of, God's, of God himself. It means that we should reflect the God who made us, the God who redeemed us, the God who rules over us. This is what Jesus was talking about again earlier in that Sermon on the Mount that, that our main text comes from. Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 7. Words that for many of us are probably familiar and, and, and words whose, whose poetry and, and beauty and aspiration has, has spoke to humanity through the ages. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Well, who do you know who is merciful, pure, and makes peace? That's God. That's our king. And he calls us to be those same things and says, as we are those things, we become notable as his people, his children. Uh, we see God in his fullness. We receive God's mercy in its fullness. One more time, I am intimidated. Okay. <laughs> Making peace. I know how to make smart aleck remarks. I, I, I have a black belt in sarcasm. Okay. I, can, I consider it a gift. I just don't know who it comes from. You know, mercy. I find myself lying awake at night imagining all the conversations I would have with people to subtly get even with them without their realizing it. I don't know if you've ever done that, but uh, I, can, I can give you tips uh, if, if you're interested. You know, this is, this is again, uh, a, something that I aspire to, that we all aspire to, but it's so difficult. It's so hard. How are we going to do that? But we see the connection to the nature of God. If this is really God's kingdom that we're a part of, if this is really God's rule that we live under, if this is really God's will to which we submit, then this is what we ought to look like. But we're in a pickle here because we have an ongoing problem. We, you and I, are weak. We're weak. Um, I felt like I ought to establish that here on my first day on the job. Um, just so you understand. Oh, John will have the solution. John isn't even sure what the problem is, okay? Yeah, that's, that's the case. Humanity's long history of failure is a history that you and I belong to. We know that long history of failure, we know ourselves, and it gives us pause when we consider the demands of God's kingdom. If the people of the past couldn't manage this, how are we going to be able to do it? Well, Jesus says to his subjects that they need to have a righteousness that is greater than that of the scribes and the, and the Pharisees. You see, in Jesus' time, everybody had an agenda. Everybody wanted God's kingdom to come, and everybody had a different idea of how it was to come. If you were to talk to the Pharisees, who Jesus specifically mentions here, as he says, your righteousness has to exceed theirs, they would have said, oh, you know, God's kingdom is going to come as we keep his commandments, and the secret to doing that is to build a wall around the commandments of rules that we will follow so that if we keep those rules, we won't get within 50 yards of violating the commandments. The traditions of the elders were a way of, of bringing righteousness and goodness to weak, rebellious people so that God would be honored and his kingdom would come. Well, there were other groups. There were the, there were the zealots. They said the way to bring God's kingdom is to take up arms because it's those people who are the problem. That's an easy thing to say. 
And then there were the Sadducees who said, well, the way to the kingdom of God is just to go along to get along. God has put these folks in charge, and we're just going to we're just going to follow them because that must, must be what he wants us to do. Well, Jesus brings something different. First of all, he acknowledges that true subjects of God's kingdom really are weak people. Oh, thank goodness that he acknowledges that. This is how he begins the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, beginning with verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Not the strong, but the poor. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who, are, who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. There is not a single word in that about human capacity, human ability, human power. That's all about being in a really bad place. And God's saying, I'm here for you. I'm taking care of you. My kingdom is for people just like you. So if you, like me, are drawn to the hope that God is making the world right, if you aspire to be salt and light in the world, bringing the reign of God into the world in even a small way, if you believe that fulfilling the law that Israel could not keep would be a way of bringing God's peace into the world. Uh, if you are taking seriously that challenge of Jesus to have a righteousness that is greater than that of the storied, admired Pharisees, don't give up because God has a solution. He is acknowledging your weakness, and he has that solution. It is this. God gives his spirit to empower his subjects. You and I, as Christ followers, are not alone. We're not left in, in our weakness. We're not left in our failure. And, and the Gospel of Matthew sets us up for this because even before Jesus announces the coming of God's kingdom, John the Baptist says what we read in Matthew 3.11, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And with fire, the Holy Spirit, God's own spirit. God does not abandon us in our weakness. He does not demand that we somehow acquire a strength beyond what our fellow humans have possessed. He gives us his own spirit who empowers us to be the people he calls us to be and to do the work that he calls us to do, to be pure, to be, bring mercy and peace, to be salt to a rotting world, to be light to a dark world. This is how God does his thing. This is how the treasure of God is in earthen vessels, just ordinary clay pots like you and me. This is how God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. He makes his spirit available to us because of Jesus, because Jesus, the divine son of God become human, took not only the guilt of our rebellion on himself, but also our weakness on himself. He died to reconcile us to God against whom we rebelled, and he rose to give life and power to us in our weakness, to take very ordinary, plain, run-of-the-mill people and turn them into the agents of his reign and of his rule. So here's the good news on top of the good news of God's kingdom. The Holy Spirit transforms us to be like our king, to be like Jesus. See, the message of the gospel is much more than we often make it out to be. It's much more than now that you're forgiven, you'd better measure up or else. Okay, and I'm seeing some notes of recognition with that one. And it's much more than, well, you're forgiven, so nothing matters, LOL, which I find occasionally with, with folks that I know. No, it's something much better, much more fulfilling, much more challenging, much more enriching than all of that. The message of the gospel is that through Christ, God gives his spirit to his subjects to empower them to become what he calls them to be and what we all in our deepest heart of hearts aspire to be but fail to be without his power. This is, this is the way Paul described it in his letter to the Galatians. I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, 
you are not under the law. In other words, if you are are empowered by God's Spirit, the Spirit transforms you to do what the law prescribes but doesn't provide the power to accomplish. The Spirit empowers us to overcome our habits and inclinations towards rebellion. So much so that we learn to do what God calls us to do, law or no law, rule or no rules. Oh, there are still rules. God made us and he made the world and, he made, and, and God is the way he is. These haven't changed. And so what he wants his people, what he calls his people, what he demands that his people do, none of that has changed. Okay? But what has changed, what is changing within us is the capacity that the Spirit brings to our lives to bring us into conformity to the image of Christ. And what does that look like? Well, here's how Paul famously describes it. Again, in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. So, if we live by the Spirit, let's also keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I believe this. Everybody wants that kind of life and that kind of character. We may become calloused. We may become hardened. We may become desensitized to that deep desire that lies within us. But I haven't met a human being who didn't want to be the kind of person that Paul is describing as he describes the fruit of the Spirit. And the message of of Jesus uh, the, the, is, is that he gives us not only reconciliation to God, but the power to live as God's people, fulfilling that desire which God has placed deep within our hearts. Those habits and behaviors, those thoughts and deeds that, 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 that vex us and frustrate us, the Spirit is in the process through our faith in Christ of transforming us so that, so that we're being renewed in the image of Christ and the old passes away, and we begin to see those glimpses in our weakness of the power of God at work. Note well, this requires cooperation. It's all about that act of surrender, isn't it? It's all about laying down the arms and receiving the the undeserved gift that the king has to give. It's all about about that process of reception. We keep in step with the Spirit. This is how the Lord makes us salt in a rotten world, light in a dark world, people who keep the law that Israel who could not keep, who are righteous in ways that even the Pharisees were not. We aren't passive. Empowerment requires cooperation with the Spirit's transforming power. It requires utter dependence and submission uh, to the King. It means we pray, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that starts with us. You know, sometimes the reality is we can be rebellious to the point of trying to use God's power for selfish purposes. That is why I think Paul ended that little passage in Galatians by saying, let's not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. No, with this, the Spirit binds us together in this enterprise, in support, in, in mutual submission to one another, in, in seeking the good for one another, in serving one another in love. So let's promise ourselves that we'll resist the urge to think of ourselves as better than others, that we'll stop doing the, the favorite pastime of, of Americans in uh, this, this third decade of the 21st century, of blaming other people for the world's problems and for the problems that we have. The chosen aren't choice. We're weak vessels transformed by God's power. So what's wrong with the world? I am. You are. We are. Yes, they are too. But let's start with I am. We all are. Um, I want to let you in on a secret. I'm old. Um, anyway, um, I, re- I remember comic strips, okay? Uh, any of you remember comic strips? They were in these things that we used to have called newspapers, okay? 
Uh, and in particular, I'm old enough to remember Pogo. Now, I'm not old enough that I could get Pogo at the time. It was a little sophisticated, but I tried. And there was a, a, famous, a famous Pogo uh, around the time of Watergate, I believe, where uh, one of the characters uh, in the swamp, uh, which was the, the setting of Pogo, said, um, modifying the, the words of uh, uh, Oliver Hazard Perry, we have met the enemy and they is us. Well, here we are. We have met the enemy and they is us. But God in Christ is doing more than forgiving lawbreakers. He's transforming lawbreakers to become kingdom subjects with transformed attitudes, and transformed actions, transforming the world in seen and unseen ways until Christ returns and makes all things new and right and good. And from that vantage, we will see how everything that the Spirit has done has fit together for that purpose. I want to be a part of that. Much as I'd like to be independent, I want to be submissive. Not intimidated, but empowered. Not discouraged, but transformed into the image of Christ, the Christ who died for the unworthy and rose in victory over death. Give me some of that. Give me a lot of that. Give me all of that. And you too. Let's pray. Lord God, this is our confession, uh, that we are weak, but you are strong. And we thank you that you have called us as little ones into your kingdom. Empower us, Lord, as you have promised, as you have done by your spirit. Make us like Jesus. and May our light shine through your grace. In Jesus' name.